Hey guys, this is your COVID update with Dr. Lena. Got a little bit of a teaching update today and some of those are inspirational today. Just want to uh, do a little teaching and, and honestly, uh, some of the things I'm going to talk about, I'm like, oh, I can't believe I'm going to go there, but it needs to happen. And so I want to talk about what next, how do we integrate back into normal life? And so I want to hit up topics on herd immunization and vaccination. And I know some of you are already tuning out. Don't. This is important stuff because it pertains to our life. We are now, um, since March 20, we're now April 13th. So what is that? Um, uh, uh, 23 ish dates in uh, social isolation in my town in Chicago. You're, you may have started a little bit later or maybe a little earlier than that. Our numbers are grim in the US still. We have not reached the peak. Uh, today's data uh, 586,000 coronavirus cases in the US with 23,600 deaths. So still um, not uh, great. And, uh, but better than expected, better than expected. And so how, how do we move to the next phase? When will this end? Everybody wants to know that. When do we go back to normal? When is it safe to get out of the house? And is this our state of life forever? And, uh, by, by God, no. Uh, and I, I say this uh, rev reverently, uh, by God's grace, no. Let me talk to you about herd immunity. You might be hearing a lot about that, those words, and maybe you're confused as to what that means. Uh, herd immunity is when most of a population is immune to an infectious disease. All right. Uh, so let me give you an example. If 80% of the population is immune, then four out of five people who encounter the disease will not get sick and will not spread the disease. So that's a good place to be, right? How do you accomplish that? How do 80% of the population becomes immune? Two ways. You either get an infection previously and you become immune or you are vaccinated against it. And so right now people are talking about that. Well, if I get the COVID, will I be immune forever? No, not necessarily forever. The thought process is weeks, maybe months, but no one knows for sure. The data is being collected and, and, and studied. And so there's some models that those, those conclusions are built on, but we will know in time. Uh, the antibody test that people have been talking about, the blood test that looks at the antibodies in, in, in your body, the antibodies are, um, are an indication in your blood of uh, your body fighting against foreign substances, including the virus. And so you can test for antibodies against the coronavirus and tell whether you've had it or not. Uh, uh, they're a good test, but not prevalent yet. Remember, we're still talking about swabs. And so the blood test is a steps further in, but, but, and, and how many people can be tested for that to check, uh, uh, whether you've had the infection or before? Well, you understand how this can become a problem when you're looking at in the United States, 320 million people, adults, I think 209 million people. So let's talk about numbers like that for a minute. Um, the, the more infectious a disease, uh, the more people need to be immune in order to accomplish herd immunity. So a measles example would require that one is very infective. In fact, it has a infectivity number R0 or R0 of 12 to 19. The flu, to give you a comparison, measles is at 12 to 19. The flu is at 2 to 3. Coronavirus, the numbers, I mean, a couple things. At one point, they thought it was like 5.7. I think right now, most people would settle at 2 to 3, which would mean that you would need 70% herd immunity for the population to be immune. So again, what does that translate into? In the United States, we've got about 209 million adults. So 70% of that would mean 146 million need to have the disease in order for us to accomplish herd immunity and go back to normal. All right, that's crazy. So uh, w w let's break that down further. If your infection fatality rate is 1%, 1% of people uh, who are infected will die, that boils down to 1.5 to 1.7 million deaths. Okay. That's pretty intense. In Chicago, my town, we've got two and a half million adults. That's going to be about, oh, you need to, who needs to get infected? About 1.89 to 2 million people need to get the infection in Chicago. Our numbers are uh, in Illinois are only at like 22,000 today. So we got a long ways to go. Now you might say, but not everybody's tested. Correct. And so really hard to be able to come to decent conclusions as to how many people actually have this. This is why everyone's always saying the testing is the problem if you, but, but how do you test everybody in the U.S.? Again, challenges. Uh, an estimate this, uh, I saw uh, a source that estimates 320 out of 100,000 people in the U.S. are being tested so far for COVID. That number may be a couple days old. It's probably better by the time you watch this video, but still, we've got a long ways to go, people. And, and that's, uh, that's part of the problem is, is, is the idea of just getting enough people infected in order to accomplish herd immunity is just not logical. And so a vaccine is needed. That sort of brings us to that, which is a very controversial topic, which is a topic I wish I didn't have to address. Um, uh, and most people in the U.S. are vaccinated, but those who are not are very loudly against it. And uh, uh, my point in the next few minutes is not to rile up the anti-vaxxers. God bless you. You have been sustained by 
the vaccinations of many. Why do I say this? Well, let me give you some numbers. At the turn of the 20th century, one out of six kids died before age five due to infectious diseases, all right? In the last century, 300 million lives saved because of vaccines. Um, smallpox eradicated. Polio eradicated in the, our side, in the Western America's gone. Uh, 93 to 99% reduction in chickenpox, measles, mumps, rubella, rotavirus, pneumococcus, H flu, pertussis, tetanus, and diphtheria. Uh, I remember in my residency in the late 90s, uh, regularly doing spinal taps on kids with fever to look for the pneumococcus and the H flu. And the H flu less so by the time I came around, but the pneumococcus. And now, barely existent. Why? Because of the vaccines. And so, so before you give me a list of why vaccines are evil, uh, read the numbers, people. Talk to your pediatricians. Get the data. It is stunning how much our lives are better because of the vaccines. And if you're not convinced, look at the last 30 days of us locked up in our homes, and primarily because we do not have a vaccine for the coronavirus. The flu vaccine, again, a comparison because both uh, corona and flu are viruses and sort of remind us of each other. And, and so flu vaccine, of course, um, the 1910s, you know, the great flu pandemic that destroyed so many lives. Uh, finally, a vaccine in the 1930s uh, it became large scale in 1945. And by the way, uh, God help us if it takes 20 years to get a vaccine. We're all talking about a year from now, and that would be the greatest miracle to get a vaccine for coronavirus in a year. But um, but by the time it became uh, available, it has now in 2020 uh, reduces risk of flu by about 40 to 60 percent among all populations. Just in 2017 to 2018, that's the flu vaccine prevented 6 million illnesses, 3 million hospitalizations, 90,000 or, or 3 million medical visits, 90,000 hospitalizations, 5,700 flu-related deaths in one year, okay? So the benefits of this vaccine, again, um, huge in my humble opinion. Um, you know, I, I think a lot about, you know, with herd immunity, the infection of many saves the whole. With vaccinations, the vaccines by many saves the whole. And so we've got about, what, 10 to 20% of the population I hope less than that, who might be against vaccines and who might be saying, I'll never get the vaccine because they're trying to poison me. And there's this theory and Bill Gates is behind it and he's trying to take over the world. Well, you might believe that, but uh, my hope and, 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 and an act of love would be for most of us to actually look at logic and look at numbers and look at data and see in vaccines a common grace uh, where our willingness to take a vaccine will protect the many. And so when a vaccine becomes available, you better believe that myself and most of the healthcare professionals that I know will be at the front of the line. And uh, uh, I think a lot of, about this concept with vaccines and, and, and people who don't want to vaccinate their kids and this idea of common grace, you know, I, I, I used to, I, honestly, I used to get bent about people who are constantly giving lectures about why we should not vaccinate kids. Uh, and, and it's crazy because I see the effects as a pediatric ER doctor of kids who are not vaccinated and the illnesses that they face. It used to bother me. And now I'm no longer bothered because I realize that this is life. I mean, there's going to be people, who, be people who disagree. The hope is that enough people will see the value of a vaccine. And I would think by now that enough people are seeing the value and hoping and praying that it would happen soon. It reminds me of sort of when I feed my birds. Uh, I feed my birds because of the red cardinal. I love the red cardinal. And I want him to come and eat so I can see him and bless him and he blesses me in turn. And um, everybody else benefits from it. Again, not a great analogy numbers wise, but uh, it's sort of like that for those of you who don't believe in vaccines, uh, hopefully enough people will do and hopefully enough people will. And uh, because of their willingness to love and their willingness to do what's logical, you will be protected if you're anti-vaccine uh, person. And so uh, God bless you. Uh, just understand that you are riding on the willingness of others to, uh, to, to, uh, to lovingly uh, get vaccinated in order to protect immunity so that most of us will be able to go back to normal. So um, right now, three case scenarios in terms of the future. Number one, worst case scenario has been an option that all of us said, no, we don't want that, which is uh, no physical distancing. Uh, at one point, I think the Prime Minister of England sort of joked about, well, well, if enough people get immune, we're protected, let everybody go out and go crazy. And, and everyone said, no, that's not a smart idea. And so pretty much the whole world is uh, doing some form of social distancing because the worst case scenario without social distancing would mean that the virus would infect many people in a few months and medical systems would be overwhelmed and lots of people would die. Not an option. Best case scenario, uh, we stay in this state, which is also not a great scenario, uh, but we maintain the current level of infections, which is less than the, what they estimated. Maybe we even reduce those numbers until a vaccine becomes available. But uh, what if it takes two years to get a vaccine? 
impossible to live this way because as many of you have noted, uh, there's this balance between, again, protecting lives, but now what kind of life do we have? And when people are losing jobs and the economy suffering and, and on and on and on, and not that we're making economic decisions, but there are realities and really just the value of life that we're living right now, not sustainable. I think everybody would uh, start to understand that at this point. It's time to pull over and take a potty break if, if you use the analogy that I once gave on, on a road trip. And, and, and so what, what is a good middle of the road um, scenario? Well, it's probably the most likely scenario, which is uh, infection rates, as infection rates rise uh, and fall over time, decisions will be made. So we would relax social distancing when the numbers fall and re-implement them when there's an increase in infectivity. And so this is where you're hearing a lot of medical professionals like Dr. Fauci talking about second wave of illness and the third wave of illness. When will those happen? We don't know. We have estimates, maybe October, November, maybe later in the winter. Until a vaccine is available, there is going to be, and this is our new reality, this is the part that I think we need to be aware of and 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 lean into now as we get to this phase where we haven't quite reached the peak, but everybody sort of now is aware, like, what's next? And as we consider that and integrate um, certain jobs that go back to work and, and think through now, what do we do moving forward? My, my nephew, 15, 16, uh, plays football, sent me a text today. What will happen with football season in the fall? Are, are we going to be able to play? And, and his brother just got a scholarship to go to college and play football and so many dreams and so close to home besides the, you know, the loss of life due to COVID, the reality of what do we do now? And, and uh, I had to text him back and say, honestly, I don't see a world until a vaccine is had where you can have 50,000 people in a stadium to watch a football game, uh, let alone even in high schools where there's hordes of people to watch a game. Will we go back to normal? Um, maybe not normal, but maybe more normal than what we're doing now. And so our job is to uh, lean into those decisions and see, and hopefully with some of the data that I went over today, I know this is a little bit more technical than some of the other COVID updates that I've had. I thought of doing this in a live q and I might do a follow-up Q&A, but just a lot of controversy over vaccines and a lot of emotions that I'd rather not deal with in a live situation, to be honest with you. With you. And uh, just praying that God will use this material to help some of you who are just in need of some stability and maybe some some perspective and maybe even hope for the future of saying, all right, we're not going to be in this stage forever. Will it go till May 1 or June 1? I, June 1? I don't know. I know that eventually some things will be loosened, but we'll still be careful until, by God's grace, he will grant us a vaccine. And then uh, you're going to find me at the top of that line waiting. And uh, hopefully many of you will follow so that uh, the all would benefit from what is called herd immunity, which brings me to the end of this COVID update. Hey, I still believe God is in control. I still believe he's got good coming out of the sea. And I love you guys. I'll catch you guys in the next update. In the meantime, stay safe. Uh, do what you need to do. Keep looking up. Uh, it's going to get better. We're going to get through this. I love you guys.